shed some light on the lengths the Vikings would go to to be able to trade, it's this. This is known as ring money. Now, these may look like bracelets, but there's a clue in the name. They were used as currency. What you've got here is silver that's been melted down. It may have come from coins or from plunder. But the Vikings have made an attempt to create a high quality, standardized form of currency that they can trade with. So what you would do is hack up one of these bracelets and these would allow you to have different transactions. A smaller one might go for a bag of grain. You might use half a bracelet for a cow. And this was a way of trading in a non-monetary society. The Vikings on the whole didn't use coins, but these allowed them to trade internationally. Behind all this trading, was a system of brutal exploitation. This is an amazing little object. It really encapsulates so much about what the Vikings stood for, how they appeared to people. And it's a piece of slate that's been carved into, etched into, presumably by a child. And it's akin to you know, scratching with a compass into a wooden desk. You need this replica, made from a cast, to bring the scene to life. There's this wild-haired Viking here, wearing a chainmail shirt, and he's moving towards this uh, longboat here, with the oars depicted there, and dragging behind him, there's this um, man who's presumably a monk, because he's got a reliquary box chained to his waist. Now, this was designed to contain relics of saints. So either parts of their bone or else things that they came into contact with, like their books or their vestments. And these were particularly prized within monasteries as they were thought to connect the individuals directly with the saints themselves. And what it's showing is that during these Viking raids, it wasn't just plunder that was taken, people were taken too. Slaves were very valuable and could be sold on. And um, the money that was transacted could be turned into amazing objects like this. This is a brooch. This was used to hold a cloak up and it's just such an extravagant expression of wealth. It's enormous, it, it weighs nearly a kilogram. And the decoration, it's all about display. So there's a connection between these objects. You've got this image of slavery and movement of goods via these longboats, and then the finished product. Slavery stretched across the entire Viking trading network, far afield, and also, as these manacles show, closer to home. Slavery was at the very heart of the Viking world. Not only were slaves important for trade, they were also essential for agriculture and manufacture. They formed part of a complex hierarchy where there were degrees of free and unfree people. Indeed, Viking society was remarkably organised. There were systems in place to organise the family, the household and the tribe. Society was held together in no small part by women who played a fascinating and powerful role. We can see that reflected through the finds from their burials. So this is the burial of a wealthy woman from Gotland in Sweden. And here there are beads that are so colourful and drawn from all number of exotic locations. Then you've got this key that's on a chain this is a symbol of her role as lady of the house. She controls the key to the home, but also to the treasure chests. While the men are away on raiding missions or trading, women had to control the wealth of the household. And this symbolic key reflects that power and authority. Then there's more intriguing finds. There's a spindle here 
which suggests that she was involved in the craft of tapestry making and weaving, but perhaps symbolically it also reflects this association between women and the Norns, these mystical women who spun the strands of fate and could cut off destiny. What we can see from these sorts of grave goods is that women were respected and revered and even played a role within the spiritual framework of the religious system. It's interesting when you think of the role of women in Christian society, in a church that the hierarchy of which is predominantly male. It seems that within Viking society, women could exert that extra bit of power but Christianity and its new power structures couldn't be kept at bay forever. And the objects here show how it began to influence the Vikings. This little fellow from a rich woman's grave is the earliest crucifix to be found in their world. And it heralds the start of a new era. Christians weren't supposed to trade with non-Christians. And for a while, the Vikings were able to get around this by making the sign of the cross every time they encountered a Christian to imply that they shared this set of beliefs and therefore could exchange goods. But as Viking society was changing, Christianity started to offer additional benefits. So as the tribal structure was becoming more and more hierarchical and certain individuals were growing in power, almost becoming king-like in their power, Christianity gave this structure whereby a king gained their power on earth from the king in heaven. So Christianity offered the Vikings not just increased potential to trade, but also a political and ideological framework that could fit with their changing place in the world. So the Vikings then were pragmatists. The old world they turned their back on wasn't immediately lost. It was sometimes incorporated, at least symbolically, into the new one. Here is a necklace made up of 35 separate pendants, each one of which is gold, silver and bronze and is in the shape of a fish tail. The fish was an important symbol in Christianity because of its name in Greek, ichthyos. If you take each of the letters in Greek, they spell out the phrase, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Saviour. So you have this elaborate play with this word and that was very important to Christianity. It was a religion of the book. It was a religion that prized literacy. And so its symbolism also plays with words. But what's interesting is that the fish seems to have been one of the symbols that made the greatest impact on pagan Germanic people. And it's one of the first symbols that appears, I think, because of the fact that it prizes this part of the natural world, this living creature, the fish. The people we know as Vikings were many different people spread over a vast area. They didn't all convert to Christianity at once nor did their new religion necessarily put an end to their raiding. Here you can see two small fragments of marble and this one has been used as a pendant at some point. You can see there's a hole that's been drilled through so that it can be worn on a chain or a leather thong around the neck. Similar pendants have been found that have the residue of precious metals on the surface. And it's possible that these are being used as touchstones to assess the quality of gold and silver. The metals are rubbed against the stone and then the quality can be assessed. And what's interesting about this example is it's made of porphyry. Now porphyry was a marble that was used extensively on the continent in churches. And here we have another piece of porphyry. And this seems to have come maybe from 
the floor of a church in Rome, possibly. It's clearly a tile that has been prized up from the ground and taken away as a souvenir. But what these two examples demonstrate is a reappropriation of this precious marble porphyry and all its associations with the imperial past and the church. It's gone from this sort of a context to this sort of a context. It really makes me think that what at first can look like destruction can actually be transformation and reappropriation. And let's face it, the Vikings had a healthy appetite for reappropriation. They returned time and again to Britain, reappropriating everything in sight. And eventually, the kings of the British Isles began to pay them to go away. This became known as the Dengeld. The Dengeld was a medieval protection racket on an impressive scale. It goes down in history as one of those good ideas at the time. What this meant, though, was that the Vikings kept coming back. In the 10th and 11th century, they started to settle more and more, taking over the land as well. So they never went away. And this led to the creation of the Dane law. The Dane law was Danish held territory in England. And it eventually stretched from Northumbria all the way to the Thames. In Scotland, it was mainly Norwegian Vikings who made political centers across the Northern and Western Isles and the very north of Scotland became their south, their Sutherland. By the early 11th century, much of the present-day British Isles were ruled and settled either by these Norwegian or Danish Vikings. In our search for the true impact of the Vikings on the British Isles, we need look no further than that most seminal of dates, 1066, Traditionally, the history books have it that the Anglo-Saxons, led by Harold Godwinson, take on the Danes at Stamford Bridge and win, before ultimately being defeated by the Normans at Hastings. We have these three culturally distinct groups, the Danes, the Anglo-Saxons and the Normans. But there's a wonderful irony to the events of this year, because to some extent all sides are Vikings. The most obvious connection is with the Danes, but when we look at the Normans, they get their name from being Norse men that have settled in France. Then we get the Anglo-Saxons, who, because of the Dane law, were profoundly influenced by Viking culture and society. As the objects here show, the Vikings infiltrated the culture as well as the DNA of the British Isles. As warriors and traders, family men and powerful women, ridiculous show-offs and devout believers, they became us. So, if you're still wondering how better to understand the Vikings, then you just need to look within. Bob Hoskins is with us on BBC HD tonight in a star-studded cast, including Jamie Winston and Roger Lloyd Pack. The girls on the factory floor are after equal pay and they'll stop at nothing to get it. Made in Dagenham is next.